We've been waiting for you. Welcome back to the podcast. We're in a dungeon right now, actually. Please, if you're watching this, please send help. Please. Call hey guys, we're back with another podcast episode. Um, my name is Seamus. We have Michelle and Bridget. Um, today we are talking about public etiquette in the dog world. Um, what to do out in public with your dog, what's inappropriate and appropriate, um, maybe some crate training stuff. And then we also wanted to discuss red flags when finding a dog trainer. We've got a couple of, of topics to cycle through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think with like the public etiquette one, I know that this was um, Seamus' suggestion to talk about, so we can definitely make sure that he jumps in on it. But for me, I think the biggest piece is um, just trying to be obviously responsible with your own dog and respectful of other people and their dogs in that space as well. Um, and always assuming that, don't assume that you know anything about the other dog's temperaments or personalities or things like that. I think a big one is we've always heard Everyone's heard the phrase, don't worry, he's friendly. That's the title. Yeah. It's the title of the podcast is <laughs> yes. Don't Worry, He's Friendly. Don't worry, he's friendly. Um, yeah. So, James, what were you thinking about covering when you thought of this topic? Well, my biggest things, I guess, is is kind of what you were going over, um, you know, on walks, how to how to work through, you know, having either people or other dogs coming up to you while you're walking your dog in that structured walk and everything. Um, whether your dog has is working through things or not, um, I think it's important to be aware of what else is going on around you. Um, so my biggest things would be kind of like how to maybe appropriately tell people that are coming up to your kids or, or other dogs, you know, mm -hmm. um, that you don't want them interacting. You don't want mm -hmm. your dog interacting or even yourself interacting with them, right? Um, I think a lot of people, especially if you have a really cute like puppy or something like that, yeah. you know, it, it, for some people, it just it's inclined that they just can come up and just pet your dog, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing that I would, I kind of go over a lot with owners and stuff is, you know, appropriately say, there, there's there's a rude way to say it, I think, which yeah. which can be effective, you know, especially if you if your dog, you're advocating for your dog, right? And that's one thing that we've said multiple times in this podcast. So advocating for your dog, but trying to do it in a respectful way, right? Obviously, especially if it's like a little kid or something that they just don't know, they're, they maybe they have a dog at their house that they're used to just going up and petting, right? Um, and, and as well as like adults and other dogs. So typically how I come... How I explain it to, to owners is, you know, um, when you're walking, especially if you are working on something and you see, usually you can at least see them coming, you know, you can see the kid running up to you or the person walking their dog and they got a big <laughs> smile on their face and you, you know it's coming, yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> and it's just something generally, the easiest way is just creating distance, right? Just literally just be moving out of the way and making it very clear that we're not having this interaction. Yeah, right? with your body language, like yes. moving away, creating the distance kind of sends that message without mm -hmm. directly having to speak to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and and even, I found even like kids can pick up on that. You know, if you, if you are walking, you know, we go to Cudell and there's kids playing on the playground and all that stuff. Sometimes they'll run up to you and everything. And just literally just creating that distance is enough for them to at least kind of stop and ask or whatever. And then mm -hmm. if they ask, you know, just being polite and just saying, oh, no, they're in training. You know, I was like, I even tell her, like, even if you're not doing anything at that mm -hmm. time, just say yes. it, just say it, just say, yep, yeah, they're working on something, you know, mm -hmm. um, and try to be a little bit more polite on it. And I found a really effective way is just keep walking too. Don't, don't mm -hmm. stop and feel like you have to like explain mm -hmm. yourself. Or pause. Just, yeah. Just, hey, sorry, we're, we're working on something, you know, I, I appreciate you asking, but we're just going to keep walking. Right. And then just keep right. doing that. I found that that person for me has been really effective. Um, but how, how do you guys typically, typically handle that? Um, well, no is a complete sentence. Just telling somebody, no, you cannot pet my dog. And that's one way to do it. Um, 
where we don't feel like we have, an, have to have an explanation for why the dog can't be pet. I just, you will either say no or no, they're in training and use your technique of just like using my body language to show I'm not open to a conversation right now. Um, if it's a child, I will probably be a little bit nicer. No, they're in training, uh, but you always, always have those kids that kind of walk with you and they're like, I like dog training. <laughs> and they're like, no, well, we, we can't interact right now. Sorry. And just having them explaining it to children versus adults is just a little bit different. Yeah. I think some of it depends on how the person is approaching. Like, I think that there's people that ask and then mm -hmm. there's people that just assume. Mm -hmm. And even if they're asking, they're already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I heard so, that a lot. Yeah. So it's like, I, like if somebody truly like from a respectful distance says like, Hey, do you care if like our dogs say hi, or can I pet your dog? Mm -hmm. I would be the nicest person in the world. I'll be mm -hmm. like, Oh, that's so nice of you to ask. I'm sorry. Not right now. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and usually if they were respectful enough to ask at a distance, they're typically very responsive to that answer of being nice and polite in return. And they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, the people that ask while they're continuing to approach or just don't even ask at all, I will be honest, I usually am a, quite a lot less nice and firm with those people because I found that trying to be nice when they're already not respecting an assumed boundary mm -hmm. that they should, they're probably not going to listen to you being nice mm -hmm. either. Or they're not even like waiting for a response from you. Because yeah. I've had people where I'm like, oh, please don't pet him. Mm -hmm. And they just like don't Keep even going. hear you. Yeah. And they yeah. just like go back. So honestly, like whether it's they're bringing their dog over or it's them approaching or it's a kid approaching, I honestly, I just say stop, mm -hmm. like very firmly. I'll put my hand out. Exactly. No petting. Exactly. Um, especially because I use the no marker with my dog. I don't want to say like no or mm -hmm. something like that because I don't want my dogs to like perceive something weird. So I usually would just say like stop. And mm -hmm. that usually is like alarming enough for people that I kind of like, ooh, you know, and it's, I'll. Makes them hesitate. Yeah, exactly. And so then I'll be like, you can't pet them right now. You know, we're training and, and kind of for that way, because some kids, I mean, they go into this like zombie mode where they just like, oh, doggy. <laughs> and they just go for it. Um, and especially like in the context of, I mean, a lot of the clients that we get here, their dogs are generally not super social friendly most of the time um, not always and I know my own dog when I have him out like he doesn't like to be touched by people he doesn't know so I I would much rather be rude to somebody than have like an incident on my hands you know yeah. where things happen um so yeah that's typically how I handle it is dependent on their approach depends on my energy <laughs> that I give back to them um but yeah, like Seamus said, you can usually tell like right from the beginning, like if somebody's like thinking about it. And a lot of times with body language, mm -hmm. you can send a signal to stay away. If that doesn't work. Even like if I can see from a distance, like I'm on a hike and there's only so much mm -hmm. space that I can create and I can see the person's like, oh yeah. And they just have, don't have their dog under control. I will preemptively typically say like, please keep your dog over there. You know, I don't want my dogs to say mm -hmm. hi right now. And sometimes they're startled by that, but they usually then like reel their dog in and they typically look at my dogs like, oh, they must be mean yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But whatever. I, 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 I don't, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't, I don't really <laughs> care. Um, I just had a client the other day that's had a really hard time keeping the kids in her neighborhood, like away from her dog when she's walking and the dog is muzzle trained and stuff like that. And he's not a huge bite risk outside of the home, but um, I told her, I was like, just walk him in the muzzle. Yeah. I said a muzzle can be a wonderful deterrent for people. Yes. Yeah. Some people, they don't care still, but mm -hmm. a lot of people, they see a muzzle and for whatever reason, they trust the dog less when it's like, well, now he can't bite you, but right. anyways. Yeah, they, they see <laughs> then, the muzzle they're yeah, they see the muzzle and they're like, oh no, and then they steer away. So a lot of times that can be a deterrent. Mm -hmm. I think it's also, like some people have a hard time advocating for themselves yeah. and they're not realizing like advocate for your dog. So even if you have a hard time speaking up and getting what you want in your personal life, say I need to advocate and care for my dog. It's the best option. Mm -hmm. Like we were saying, even a really, really friendly like doodle puppy that attracts everybody in the park <laughs> toward them. Yeah. I have clients that are like, well, why shouldn't I let people come say hi to my dog? And um, I had a dog, Tortilla for instance, that 
was a lot of her puppyhood, her dad just let whoever come up to Tortilla and pet her. Mm -hmm. So in public, it wasn't that she was aggressive. She just wanted to say hi to everybody all the time, which really, if she was in a recall situation, she'd rather be with the stranger than her father. And obviously you can see a lot of issues with that. And we want our dogs to remain focused. And if we do have a friendly dog, um, it can be quite challenging because we'd be like, yes, technically they are friendly, but I still don't want you to pet them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think some of it is maybe like, I don't know, there's a couple angles you could come at it as of like how um, you should conduct your dog and yourself in public Mm -hmm. and then how you should try to enforce like boundaries of other people, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're in public too. Cause like if, I, if, if we're taking a dog out in public, especially a dog that is truly in training still, like kind of in the bulk of their training, I think it's super important to know like, what, what is your goal of going out in public right now? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Mm-hmm. Because I think it's important to focus on like one thing or one specific thing. And that goal could be that you're meeting a friend at a park for your dog to socialize with that person mm-hmm. and meet a new person. Um, and then doing that appropriately, like trying to really <clears throat> pick and choose and make it very curated mm-hmm. and like productive what you're working on. And then anything that tries to like infringe on that specific goal, you're very good at setting those boundaries. Mm-hmm. I mean, like we're not doing that today. Mm-hmm. You know, if you went to the park with the purpose of walking and working on your dog's ability to focus on you and be engaged with you and ignore everybody and somebody asks, oh, but can I pet your puppy? He's so cute. No, you cannot. Because that's what you're working on. Exactly. So that's what you're working on. Maybe the next week you're there to let your dog interact with a few select people. And that's fine, you know, if that's what your role is. But you need to kind of zero in on what your goals are and make sure that you stick to that when you're out in public. And it's like, I always explain it to clients, like risk versus benefit. And there is little to zero benefit of a stranger or stranger dog coming up and interacting with your dog. That does nothing for your dog, especially on the on leash um, setting. It doesn't benefit them at all. And I heard another trainer recently explain it. It's a little far off here, but explain it like if you had a human child and people, strangers were coming up and be like, oh, can I touch your baby? Oh my, can I, can I touch your baby? Come on, let me touch your baby. And you're like, you'd be like, uh, absolutely not. My baby's not a toy and your dog's not a toy. And although they might be cute and look friendly, you always have the right to advocate and say no. Yeah. Um, another, another thing, topic or that kind of blends in with the, the public aspect is, um, cars is with a dog in the car not only how you work with dogs in cars while you're traveling and everything like that but also um you know and i do this with sully you know i'll roll the window down a little bit and let him kind of stick his head on everything every once in a while but um but i find that that can be sometimes it can be a little difficult for owners where they, their dogs barking out the window. You know, we see that all the time when we're going, driving and everything, or when we're walking, we'll drive by and the dog's just going nuts and stuff out the window. So, um, or you get stopped at a red light and uh, I just had a client that was just telling me that, you know, their dog's in the back seat and the second someone even just like looks over, the dog just goes nuts, you know, in that, in that car setting. And, you know, I, I get it's a moving thing and it can be a little stressful with some dogs maybe even some motion sickness or whatever with some dogs but um controlling them in the behaviors right and this is i think a lot of people have difficulty with because obviously eyes on the road you know you're focusing on what you're doing um so it can be hard to kind of be looking back and seeing if they're holding a bed state or anything like that so um i was kind of curious on your guys's like opinions with that if they're if if you guys have a problem with that or see issues commonly with that, um, and kind of what, like mm-hmm. how you deal with that with owners. Yeah. I think it like happens a lot more frequently than, um, you, you'd think like, I just had a client that said for the last four years of the dog's life, the dog had to ride up front with somebody because it was so nervous mm-hmm. in the back and they spent four years in that situation. At the time it's what they had to do and what they felt, they needed to do, but in reality, it's pretty unsafe 
to have a dog in the front seat. Yeah. And it's pretty unsafe to have your dog be able to go to your windows and pace in the car. So I instructed them, I said, give him a correction if he tries to go up and even touches the center console. And they were like, Oh my God, for four years, we struggled with that. And now he stays in the back seat and he doesn't even want to come out. Mm -hmm. And if we make the boundary clear and have some car manners, whether that's the dog's not allowed up front and we correct for something pretty specific, pause on the center console, pause on the seats, pause on the windows, that clarifies to the dog like what the rules in the car are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a ton of experience having a dog hold a down stay in the car and trying to be the driver. I don't sure. know if you do anything like that. I think that a good like. I think this touches on a good overall concept of like training versus management in situations. Like I think that a lot of <laughs> things that go wrong with dogs, it's because. The dog is not trained and then you're also not managing them properly in accordance with that lack of mm -hmm. training. So it's like if your dog is not trained or you're not able to communicate to them to the capacity of like stay in the back, then they need to just be secured in some way so that they can't mm -hmm. get up into the front, mm -hmm. you know, or climb or do things like that. So like I'm a huge advocate for just creating your dogs in the car. I create all of my dogs in the car. It's the safest option. It's the safest option. Um, my shepherd, when he's not in the crate in the car, he sits like this <laughs> and he looks around like, what am I doing out here? This is weird. Why is it like, moving? This is weird. Um, now I will say my doodle cash, he does love to stick his head out the window every mm -hmm. once in a while. So if I'm going on like a, not a highway trip, very short trip you know, he'll probably be in the back seat, and I let him look out the window every once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, his car manners are very good. Um, so I would say that, of course, there's risk versus reward and stuff like that. But ideally, if the dog is really struggling in the car, like if you have a dog that the window is down and it's going berserk, first of all, the window should not be down. Mm -hmm. right. Second of all, that dog needs to be secured in some way. <laughs> um, you either need to train it to make it safe or behaving appropriately, or you need to in turn have management in place so that they can't practice and rehearse those mm -hmm. really unsafe behaviors. Um, and I think that even translates over into public settings. Like if your dog cannot recall, do not take the leash off. Yeah. It's a very conscious decision to unhook that leash. <laughs> I understand accidents happen and things, equipment fails and stuff like that. Um, so things do happen. But in that case as well, if your dog is not trained to the capacity to be off leash, you need to make sure your equipment mm -hmm. is at a level where they will not accidentally end up off leash. Yeah. You know, so where you lack in training, you need to compensate in management mm -hmm. for your dog. Yeah. Well, I think one thing, one thing just to clarify on that where you were saying you know don't take your dog off leash until they can do a recall it's not just until they can do one recall yes it is yes. until they are good at their recalls and can do them regardless of yes. distractions right yes. i think a lot of people you know especially with the with the boarding trains which understandably you know they get their dog back they haven't seen them in four weeks right they they see how good they are in the sign home mm -hmm. or maybe in the first week or so and so they start getting a little cocky with Right? Mm -hmm. They start like, oh, yeah, we can do all this stuff now and everything. And then one thing goes bad. Right. And so that's one thing I always try to be clear with is if you're working on training, do so. But really try to hone in, especially when you're doing awfully stuff like, mm -hmm. you know, there I will not like recommend off leash training or anything like that until the owners are 100 percent confident mm -hmm. that it's like. They've done long line training maybe, or they, you know, they have a yard where they can work on it in the backyard or something like that, where they can do some extra training off leash, whatever it may be, where they've been able to see distractions and work through issues and still get them to come back. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one thing that you, you, you were talking about, I think yesterday or so what's with. Yeah. In the meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, I would venture to say that like. I don't know. Most of the success with off leash is just the handler. Of yes. course, the dog needs to know yeah. the things, but mm -hmm. also the handler has to have a certain skill level. Like if I gave you like Snoop is fully off leash trained, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you could take him and he could be off leash with mm -hmm. you either. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's just a very different thing. Yeah. Um, so 
I think the handler is a big piece of it. And then, yeah, in our meeting yesterday, I was talking about um, with a lot of my clients when we're transitioning to off-leash work, I, even with my own personal dogs, as I've raised them and gotten them to off-leash, I am never comfortable with them off-leash until they've chosen to either not comply with a recall or they've acted on an impulse mm-hmm. and taken off and they get a correction for it. Learning from mistakes. Yes. Okay. I, I want them to know what's on the other side of that choice mm-hmm. <laughs> because I will never feel comfortable with them off leash until I know that they've made that mistake. They've felt the repercussions of it and they're like, okay, that's off limits. Mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Um, or just uninterested, unmotivated. You know? Exactly. Like, well, that wasn't worth it. You know. <laughs> exactly. They're like, I can function with a ton of freedom as long as I stay within those boundaries and that's worth it to me, you know, and they don't push the limits anymore with that. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a big mistake that people make is they're like almost testing it. They're like, we'll see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. Or I've, I've come in contact with a lot of people that assume because their dog is fearful and clingy, that mm-hmm. they would never run away. Mm-hmm. Those are always the ones that are like, see ya. Yeah, they yeah. go. Find me on Pet yeah. Searcher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they like, something spooks them and they take off. And mm-hmm. they're so flighty and everything. Um, so just because your dog doesn't ever want to leave your side in most contexts does not mean that they are safe to be off leash <laughs> at all. Like even having a perfect recall in your house and in your yard is very different than having a good, reliable recall in public and in the park yeah. and busier days mm-hmm. where we can never truly predict what's going to come out of the woodworks, whether that's a cat, a squirrel, etc. Mm-hmm. And we need to prepare our dogs to live in reality and practice ignoring stimuli in their environment. Yep. Yeah, there's like with Snoop, I mean, I use him as an example, obviously, because he's my most recent example of like having to train a dog from start to finish. Any time I took him, it was almost like his off-leash was in phases, Mm -hmm. you know, like off-leash in my yard, first phase, off-leash in like very, very controlled, low activity, type isolated environments was the next next phase and then like I love to hike with my dog so anytime we went to a new hiking place Mm -hmm. we went back to a long line for a while Mm -hmm. until we went for a couple visits and I felt comfortable you know so it was like it it went in a lot of different phases there's no like switch Mm -hmm. where it's like now they're off leash (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know it's like you kind of have to ease into it in certain contexts um, to make sure that you are comfortable with knowing how that dog's going to respond. Because a lot of it was, I didn't know how Snoop was going to respond if he saw a fox, if he saw a deer, if he saw a dog. And, you know, I was like, I don't know as much as he probably doesn't know. (laughs) So I need to make sure that we're all prepared. Yeah, a lot of times, a lot of times they don't know that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of times what what I have to try to explain to people as well is, most of the issues, the barking or running off, whatever, it is it is somewhat instinctual, right? So it's like, or they just don't, they've never been corrected, so they don't know what's wrong, right? Until they, until they have that one chance where they're like, oh, there's that squirrel, I'm gonna go get it, and they get really high correction, then they're like, okay, clearly that was not what mom wanted me to do, or something, you know? Yeah. So I think that is, that's, that's a important thing to kind of note as well. Yeah. Um, understanding where the correction is coming from as opposed to you we can correct a dog for running away from us until the cows come home mm -hmm. but unless we have a solid foundation of teaching and making that a habitual thing the dog can be like where the hell did that correction come from and it can Mm -hmm. be less clear to them which makes our recall faulty yes exactly well it's actually kind of an interesting example Tom, I'm going to talk about you and Barney really quick, my husband. When I met him, he actually did have an e-collar for Barney, Mm -hmm. and he would use it for, like, Mm off-leash and stuff like that. Um, And because Barney didn't really have, like, a very clear understanding of, like, an actual formal recall or that type of thing, it turned into... If the e-collar was on and they were outside off leash, Barney just wouldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. He was just like, I'll just stay here. Yeah. (laughs) And he like wasn't comfortable enough to explore and do stuff because 
he didn't quite understand why he got correct sometimes or, you know, different things like that. Um, just because the process of the training wasn't very like clear for him. And so then when, you know, we reintrodu- I reintroduced him back into the e-collar, did a little bit more formal training with the recall, then like he would venture out. And it was funny because for a while, if I was with Barney, Barney was like a normal off-leash dog doing his thing, whatever. If he was, if Tom was there, he'd just sit next to Tom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Cause that context, you know, and that, yeah. that um, familiarity of like how things used to be was still kind of there. So even just like getting an e-collar, you know, and correcting your dog for running away or things like that yeah. doesn't automatically translate no. to them being reliably safe off leash or yeah. even understanding, you know, it's kind of like if people don't introduce an invisible fence properly, sure. the dog doesn't want to go outside at all. Yeah. Because they're like, I don't get it. I went outside. That wasn't great. I'm just never going out there again. <laughs> That's where you hear people say sometimes in, in the e-collar world, it's like, well, e-collar, um, is going to ruin my dog. And I'm like, yeah. if you use it improperly, your dog can become confused. It doesn't ruin them. Yeah. But they can become confused of what the boundary is and where that lies. And if we take the time to really teach and be forgiving with um, like our negative reinforcement and allow them to make more mistakes, mm-hmm. that produces a much stronger dog in the end. Um, particularly with Pipsqueak, I really enjoy taking my time working on her recall yeah. and I have no lofty expectations of her to go on a hike and recall to me right now, partly because she is so tiny and little that we're really just working on habitualizing that right now. Yeah. Doesn't, we're still on long line and I, it's really working for us. To well, build because that. again, the training is at the level that you want, you're mm-hmm. compensating with management, mm-hmm. you know, and taking other steps to make it impossible for things to happen because mm-hmm. you don't have the training up to the part that you want it to be. Yeah. Just mind your own business. Yeah. Everyone just mind your own business <laughs> when you're out with your dog. I don't even know if this is okay to say, but I'm going to go Please for it. Please say it. Um, yesterday <laughs> in, a, say it. in a session with Loki, we were having Loki and do a set and we pulled over mm-hmm. and this elderly lady, just like a dog on a flexi leash, just like, walking around and the dog was like a crusty old dog and it came came right up to Loki. Crusty white old dog. Yeah, like smelled him and it was like. (laughs) And Loki was like, all of us froze, David, Paige and I were frozen and we're like, do we tell this lady to bug off? Like like, she's just allowing, and Loki was like, it's not there, it's not real, it's not real, (laughs) he's not there. And David was like, I didn't say anything, but normally I would have. And he's like, I just yeah. kind of wanted to see what Loki would respond with. Yeah. Um, and with an aggressive dog, of course, we would take a complete different approach. This dog was not aggressive, not dog aggressive at all. Um, but, you know, we just wanted to take that as a learning opportunity that if these things happen, well, how do we address them? Unavoidably stuff happens. And I think that's actually a really good point to bring up of you as the person that's taking your dog out into public need to be sure that your dog is capable of handling that situation, mm-hmm. especially in worst case scenario. Yes. Yeah. Like the thing if, worst case I scenario. Am, if I am taking my dog to a park that has a playground with children on it, I need to think, what would my dog do if a child ran up and tried to hug it? Yeah. And if my answer is would not do well, then maybe you should put a muzzle on your dog when you yeah. take him to that park. Or yeah. maybe you should go to a different park. Or maybe you should specifically say, okay, I need to work on, you know, getting them more desensitized around kids Mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that. Or just being extra, extra alert, head on a swivel Mm -hmm. and ready to yell stop at any kid you see Mm -hmm. that's going to come flying up, you know, because with my dog Lumos, like I know that when I have him out in places, one, I'm very alert and aware of my surroundings, but I also know that even if somebody came up and was an idiot and just like, cause you have those people that even as they're walking by you, they like touch the yes. dog's butt. Yes. Don't be that person. Yeah. Don't, Don't do that. That is the easiest way to get bit. Yeah. But like they touch their butt as they walk by. People have done that to Lumos a million times. And he just looks back and looks at me like, can you believe that guy? <laughs> so like, I even know with him at this point where that guy would have lost a hand like uh-huh. a few years ago, his tolerance is so high at this point that like, mm-hmm. it takes a lot to yeah. really push yeah. him to that threshold. So I have gotten more comfortable and more trusting taking him to more crazy environments. 
but that's that's a big piece of it is mm-hmm. knowing that like what is my dog gonna do or could do if worst case scenario mm-hmm. happens and that's on you to mm-hmm. make sure that you're setting your dog up to be safe to be around people yeah. in those environments um now we're going to talk about a big topic that comes up a lot of what to do if like your dogs are on leash and they get approached by an off-leash dog because unfortunately this happens more than it should because people don't compensate their lack of training with proper management but um beyond that for me i do and i know bridget does as well we carry a lot of like tools that we can use if necessary i do try to like essentially like when I'm out with my dogs walking, I'm always kind of just scanning for like potential problems. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If I see a dog off leash, I kind of like watch it and observe for a little bit before I get any closer to see like, does the dog appear to be trained? Is it engaged with its owner? Is it recalling well? Are the owners paying attention? Things like that. If um, it's unavoidable, if, if I can just go somewhere else, I will. Honestly, yeah. if I can just avoid the whole situation, I will. If it isn't avoidable and I have to walk past them to get to my car, I usually, if I can tell the dog is out of control as I'm approaching and the owner is like looking in my general direction, I will say like, can you please put your dog on a leash so that I can walk by? Um, most of the time people are disgruntled, but will do it if you ask them um if the dog starts darting over (laughs) i i really really have tried to get my dogs to the point where they will for the most part not do anything unless it's like the absolute last resort that they have to so i try to if i'm with another person i usually give the dogs to that person and i go to that dog that is approaching Mm -hmm. and i'll yell at it i'll stomp at it um i usually carry like a pet corrector which is compressed air Mm -hmm. a lot of times that noise is very startling and spooks them and honestly just doing that has actually been very effective for me if i'm by myself I put myself in between the dogs. Um, and unfortunately, if I if I have my dogs with me on leash, it's not like I can just abandon them, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, the dog does get close in close proximity to my dogs. And in that case, usually what's happening is if it's long enough away and the dog is approaching and the owner is doing nothing about it, I'm telling the owner, if your dog gets close to me, I'm going to kick it. Yeah. <laughs> I will kick your dog um, because it's my job in that situation to keep this it as controlled as possible. Yeah. And I know that my dog, if he is charged and attacked by a dog off leash, he's going to defend himself. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, fortunately, he will win. I know mm-hmm. he will. So as the dog is even closer, I'm putting him behind me. I'm stepping in between them. And if I need to kick the dog to deter it, usually that is pretty effective in getting them to go away as well. Um, again, the best thing to do is try to be as calm as possible. Yeah. I uh, know that's, that's hard like part. very yeah. hard, <laughs> but it's super important to try to be as calm as possible. I, again, I'm talking to that owner the entire time. I'm communicating everything that I'm going to do to their dog that I mm-hmm. am doing to their dog and why I'm doing it um, and making it very clear. And typically, um, that's worked really well for me. There has been situations where the dog has aggressively attacked my dog. And in that case, I'm going to let my dog defend himself. Mm -hmm. And so until I can get that dog under control, I'm not going to correct my dog. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to tell him he's doing anything wrong because, I mean, he has a right to defend himself in that situation. So how how scared... um... I was scared you would be if you saw a dog sprinting at you, <laughs> off sprint. leash, coming mm-hmm. at you full sprint, right? Yeah. Not knowing if it's playful, not knowing if it's coming to bite you or anything. Exactly. It's exactly how the dog feels. It that's is no different for that dog. challenge, biologically, yeah. that's a yeah. dog seeing challenge and conflict. Exactly. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and in, in those situations, like when it has unfortunately turned into conflict, mm-hmm. I know that... Thankfully, my dog 
uh, he does it to control the situation. He doesn't do it with the intent of like, now I'm going to kill this dog, mm-hmm. um, which is just solely based on his temperament and his personality. So I am thankful in that respect. A lot of dogs, once they enter that fight mode, they're like, it's on Mm -hmm. (laughs) at this point. So usually then I am concerned with getting the other dog under control. And once I have that dog under control, then I can get my dog to back off then at that point and deliver the dog back to the owner and then have whatever conversation we need to have. Mm -hmm. Um, Thankfully, in those situations, the owners have been very, very remorseful and very apologetic and they they realize they're in the wrong they they know they fucked Um, up yeah um so that's been um i've been thankful for that and that hasn't happened a lot that's happened twice um it's like yes yeah Yeah. (laughs) unfortunately that happened twice and they were both in my own neighborhood um and that kind of leads me and then i'll let you jump in with this too as well bridget it, how I handle situations in my own space that I live in my neighborhood is very different than how I would mm-hmm. just be with a random stranger in public. Random stranger in public, I'm going to make you feel really bad for being an idiot. Mm-hmm. But I'm probably not going to go any further than that because I'm never going to see you again. Yeah. Um, if you live in my neighborhood, I deserve the right to walk my dogs and feel comfortable in my own neighborhood. Yes. So how they respond, and again, mistakes happen, accidents happen. So I have two very good examples. The first time this happened with Lumos, um, the woman was appalled. She was so apologetic. It has never happened again, right? And she was like, if there's any vet bills I need paid, if there's anything like that, I will do it, whatever. And things have been fine ever since. Great. Um, The other time, the dog attacked Lumos, um, was trying to attack Snoop. Thankfully, Lumos was there and handled Mm -hmm. the situation. Um, And then also bit my husband. And they were complete jerks about it. Had no concern, didn't ask if anyone was okay, nothing. So I called the police and I had them come write them a ticket Mm -hmm. and do the whole thing. Because, um, and I told them I was going to do that. Because Mm -hmm. again... I, if you are not going to take responsibility and I'm not going to see you change your behavior and you don't look like you're going to change your behavior, then I will be petty about it (laughs) and I will make you feel like you have to legally because again, I deserve the right to walk in my neighborhood. It's public safety. Like at that point, how terrible would you feel if uh, you didn't do anything and then it was Mm -hmm. a a child the next day that was viciously attacked? Well, and I had also another neighbor that their dog was just, I would see their dog out and about uncontrolled a lot. And I never had any run-ins with the dog, but I proactively actually went and knocked on their door. And I said, hey, I see that you have your dog off leash mm-hmm. a lot and it wanders around the neighborhood. I walk my dogs around here and one of them is not very friendly with strange dogs approaching it. So I would really appreciate if you controlled your dog and you kept it in your yard a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And I just had a proactive conversation with her and that actually was really effective. Mm -hmm. So I've always instructed clients too that like if there's one particular house or dog in the neighborhood that's a problem, just go talk to them. Yeah. You know, and just see if you can come to some kind of like compromise with it. Yeah. Because a lot of times just a conversation will fix things. Yeah. I find myself um, being almost overly prepared. So on my pouch that I carry, whether I'm with a client dog or my personal dogs, I'm always going to carry an extra leash. I'm always going to carry a can of pet corrector and I'm always going for absolute emergencies. I'm going to carry some mace and I've never had to use my mace, knock on wood, but I need to feel or have those things. So I feel a hundred percent prepared to deal with the situation. Um, unfortunately I had a very traumatic incident where one of my dogs was very brutally attacked and coming from that, I'm like hyper aware. And unfortunately that's the, what pushed me to be so aware and so almost crazy and observant about my surroundings. So get off your phone if you're walking your dog. Um, be prepared with the items that you need to be prepared with. And if something happens, just try to remain calm and go with a plan of action. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I have one other thing to you. If you own a large power breed, and even if your dog is impeccably trained, very un- under control, everything. Please stop getting offended when people take a wide berth around you mm-hmm. or if they <laughs> pick up their little dogs yep. when they pass you. Please stop. Yeah. Please stop being like, oh, it's so, they think that Fluffy is going to attack their dog. Well, maybe you, they don't know your dog. Yeah. When they I are have, being proactive. Yeah. When I have 
my chihuahua out and I see a big Rottweiler, I don't know your Rottweiler, mm -hmm. okay? I just know that it takes one bite to kill my dog. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to go pretty wide, okay? Um, so just give each other the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Don't get offended by how people are trying to live with their dogs. They're just trying to do what they think is best for their dog, what they think is safest. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a dog that is a power breed, that has a bad reputation, then just train your dog and have it perform well in public so that it's one of the ones that people are like, oh, wow, like that mm -hmm. was a really well-behaved Rottweiler. Mm -hmm. That was a really well-behaved vehicle. Rather than being like, oh, I can't believe that they picked up their little chihuahua when they walked <laughs> by me. Of course I did. Yeah. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> That's my livelihood and the child that I birthed from my womb. So <laughs> I will protect them. What does it hurt you? Why you get offended for your dog? Yeah. Your dog could not give a shit. No. When people like walk far away from Lumos because he's scary looking. I'm like, good job. Exactly. <laughs> get like, away from I us. I would too. He's alarming. Mm -hmm. Look at his eyes. They're orange. <laughs> I, Stare you know, just, like the fires of hell are in his eyes. Yeah. Like I get it. But yeah, so like don't get offended for your dog. They don't care. Yeah. yeah. I don't care at all. Um, but yeah, I think the, the theme of today mm -hmm. is try to be as responsible with your dog out in public as you possibly can. Mind your own business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, respect other people in their space. And if you can't train your dog or they're not at the level of training that they should be, make sure you have proper management in place. Mm -hmm. Be proactive. Yes. We don't want to hear, don't worry, he's friendly. Yeah. Oh, please. Please. <laughs> we are just... And most of the time, why are those the dogs that aren't friendly? Mm -mm. They get there. Or they're rude. They, Even if they're friendly, yeah. that's a very rude way to come well, in. Jada just had a terrible experience at Edgewater with Ralphie oh, the no. other day. Where this off-leash doodle ran right up behind her. She didn't even really see it coming. Mm -hmm. Pinned Ralphie on oh. the ground and was growling at it, snarling at it. And the two owners are just frozen. Just standing there. It's more me using my legs to kick the dog. Yeah. And... Oh, yeah. I'm throwing down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rated E for every dog. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other uh, last thoughts? No. I think, I think we're good. Um, Sign is up. That's pretty much it. Um, all right. Well, this is the end of the podcast. Remember, be safe out there. Yes. Be safe. Advocate for your dogs, ask questions if you need answers, and uh, we'll see you next time.